It is an honor to be here today with your pastor. We are friends. We have a lot of fun texts. Please don't look at those texts. Uh, you might think differently of us uh, if you read our text messages. Uh, but I do give honor to him today. Uh, we did, uh, in fact, form a new fellowship, uh, Apostolic Faith Fellowship. Uh, I have a godly pride in me uh, of what God is doing. Uh, we have uh, several churches here in Oklahoma that have joined, uh, that is a part of it, several churches in Texas, uh, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, and Florida as of right now. We're setting somewhere around 75 churches uh, that has become a part of this fellowship. Uh, as of yesterday, your pastor was elected as the newly uh, district superintendent, district elder of the Oklahoma district. Give him a hand. He is over all of the churches in Oklahoma. Uh, he will oversee all those churches, and so we're so thankful that he has agreed to do that. Uh, Brother Pickard, y'all know him. Uh, I think he's a little crazier than Brother Harrington. Uh, but Brother Pickard is uh, your... <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brother Pickard is uh, Brother Harrington's assistant superintendent. And so I know that they're going to uh, probably cause a lot of havoc together. Uh, and so... But we're excited about what God is doing. Um, the song that they sang, it said, I'm apostolic in every way. Amen. The apostolic church today has become apostolic in only a few ways. Uh, they're only apostolic in a handful of ways. They're not apostolic in every way. And uh, God's calling us back to our roots because... There's two things that the Word of God declares, and that is one is that there's coming a great falling away. Unfortunately, it's going to happen. People that are sitting in the apostolic churches across this world will begin to fall away. But number two is, is that the Bible tells us that He'll pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Amen. There's something that's going to happen, and that is this, is that Though the church is going to decline in people that have always been in, people are going to come in at the last minute that are going to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And apostolics need to be apostolic. Amen. We need to walk the talk. Amen. We need to say and do what we preach. Amen. We need to be apostolic in every way, not just some but in every way, amen, and I'm thankful to be a part of, of an apostolic church, uh, Faith Apostolic Center in Lawton, Oklahoma, I had, this October I'll be the pastor there for four years, uh, they're probably in the middle of music practice right now, uh, I'm so thankful for uh, the church that I pastor, I pastor a great group of people, uh, that we have Sunday school at 3.30 and our main worship service is at 4.30, and so uh, they're getting ready while we're in the middle of church right now. Amen. And uh, I'm so thankful that uh, they allow me to go and to preach and to uh, do what God's called me to do. Amen. And uh, uh, I'm thankful to be here among uh, like-minded people. Uh, I come not to straighten. Uh, you have a pastor for that. I didn't come to set things straight. I come to preach what God has given me. And uh, if you'll let me, I will try with everything that I have in me to give you a word from the Lord. Amen. Not from me, but from the Lord. Amen. Uh, every time God speaks to me, I ask him, God, please don't let this be me. Please don't let this be about me. Please don't let this be something that I want, something that is going to benefit me, but God let it benefit all. Amen. And so many times whenever I step to the pulpit and I preach, I preach not to the congregation, but I preach to myself a lot of times because uh, it is the word of God that saves us. Amen. By the foolishness of preaching. Amen. 
men will be saved. It doesn't say might be, but will be. Right. Amen. They will be saved. Amen. Right. And so today, I pray that somebody's touched. Uh, I pray that somebody is changed by the word of the Lord. Oh, yeah. Amen. The word of the Lord uh, is my friend. It is your friend. Amen. Though there are sometimes the word of the Lord chastises us, it is still our friend. Amen. It is still what's going to get us to heaven. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah, the 22nd chapter and the 11th verse. I'm reading from two passages of scripture today. Uh, Jeremiah 29 and 11. Many of you probably already know this chapter by heart, this verse uh, by heart. When you have it, say amen. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and hope. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 1, verse 2. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 1 and verse 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God beginning at the second verse again looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith I want to preach to you from this thought when an autobiography becomes a biography when a autobiography becomes a biography can we set our Bibles down father I ask you that you would touch today God that you would speak to us God, I ask you, Lord, that you would begin to move in this house, God. God, touching our minds, touching our spirits. God, in your name, I ask you, Lord, that your will would be done, God. God, in your name, I ask you, Lord, that the power of the Holy Ghost would begin to fall in this house, God. God, that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would anoint us, God. God, in your name, Lord, I ask you that the fire of the Holy Ghost would begin to move up and down every single eye, oh God. God, in your name, that you would begin to speak, Lord. God, that you would begin to touch in Jesus' name. God, that your anointing would fall on your messenger today, God. God, for I'm nothing with out you Lord but a vessel God God that you might be able to use in the name of Jesus we pray can we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise and worship him <laughs> hallelujah you may be seated when a autobiography becomes a biography when a writer begins to write a story about their own life it is called an autobiography when a writer begins to write a story about someone else's life, it is called a biography. So often in our lives, we begin to pin the own words that we would like to have. We begin to pin things that we think. We begin to write our own chapters in our own life. How many is thankful that you found your way to an apostolic church and an old-fashioned altar? Amen. But before some of us ever found our way, amen, we begin to pin things in our lives that was not right, that was not pleasing to God. We begin to pin chapters in our life that set us far away from God, amen. But then all of a sudden, there was something that happened in our lives. We found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. We found something that nothing else could do. The power of the Holy Ghost, the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our lives. We made our way to an old-fashioned altar and begin to lay down some things. And all of a sudden, amen, the author changed. 
Amen. I'm no longer the author of my life. Amen. I'm no longer the author of my story, but my autobiography now becomes a biography because God begins to pin things and he begins to change things and he begins to write things that nobody knows. Hallelujah. There are times in our lives that we begin to write chapters and we begin to write things that that is that changes us and that makes us different, amen. And but if we would allow God to just begin to pen things and and to begin to write things in our life, amen. He begins to write good. He begins to write power. He begins to write anointing in our lives. He begins to write things that nobody knew could come out of me. Amen. When people looked at me before, they didn't think that I could do this. Amen. But now, amen, because my author changed. Amen. I, I, I can write some things about myself that, that would make you cringe. Amen. I, I can write some things that I would like to have in my future. And I could write the, the bottom line of my bank account, what I'd like it to be. Amen. But if I allow God to begin to author it, amen, he begins to change those things. Amen. Things that I thought and things that I had planned and things that I wanted for my life, all of a sudden, it begins begins to change and, and God begins to do things in me. He begins to drop anointing in me. He begins to drop prophetic word in me and he begins to drop a the, the gifts of the Spirit in me. Amen. And, and whenever I, I go to church and I lay my hands on somebody, all of a sudden the Bible says that the sick begin to recover. Why? Because there's a different author in my life. Amen. It's not the same person that was writing before. The Word of the Lord tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 and 33, For God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints. My friend, can I just help you out today by telling you if there's confusion in your life, it's not God. Amen. If, if things are going on in your life and, and you're thinking in your mind uh, that, that this is all confusing to me right now and, and there's so much confusion of going on in my family and, and there's so much fighting and, and so much turmoil, my friend, it's not God authoring it. Amen. But an enemy has stepped in and begin to author things in your life that is not pleasing to him. God does not author confusion. The world that we live in today, Brother Harrington already talked about it before I ever got up here. He began to talk about the, the candidates that we have, and he began to talk about the world that we live in. It is because the author changed. Amen. The author changed. We no longer have a God society. Amen. We no longer have people that at least believe in praise. Amen. But we have a society that tells us that we need to stay in our corners and we need to accept them and we need to accept their lifestyle. And the author begin to change. And all of a sudden, because the author changed, all of a sudden we have turmoil in our world. Turmoil and pain and sickness and darkness. Chapters go on and on and on and and I can read in, in a chapter, in a book, and I can begin to wrap myself in it. And if I let God begin to be the author of my life, you, you've got to understand there's, there's some chapters in my life that God has wrote that I did not like. There's some things, there's some chapters in my life that God wrote that I was not well with. But God was the writer. You've got to understand there are some things that have gone on in your life that you probably would have never pinned before. But when you came into the church, all of a sudden you start going through your mind and going through the chapters in your life. And you realize that even though there are some things that have hurt and some things that have come your way, you would have never taken it back. You'd still be here. You'd still be worshiping God. You'd still be here on a Sunday afternoon 
while other people are watching football and other people are doing things of this world that uh, that they are sitting at home entertaining themselves even though there are some chapters brother Harrington in my life that I don't agree with and that have hurt me uh, though the author was God it still was painful it still broke me it was this time last year that God began to write a chapter in my wife and I's life. Can I share that chapter with y'all? My wife and I will be married nine years this month, the 13th. We have two beautiful daughters, Hadassah, she will be eight in February, and Alea, she just turned five on August 17th. But last year, Alea began to be lethargic and tired all the time. She didn't play as much as she used to. She kind of just sat around and didn't want to be around the other kids. She was a loner. She wanted to be by herself. While my wife was fixing her hair one day, she noticed behind Alea's ears enlarged lymph nodes. The lymph nodes behind her ear were so large that they were sticking out. They were protruding out from behind her ear. Thus began a new chapter in our life. The chapter did not start well. It started with doctor's appointments. It started with prescriptions. It started with things spinning out of I don't understand it. I, I pastor and I preach and I emphatically declare from pulpits across this nation that God is a healer and that, that God will not put things on you that you can't bear. And, and I emphatically declare to people that God will take care of your needs. And yet here is a chapter in my life where I begin to cry myself to sleep at night because they're telling me that my child has lymphoma, has cancer. To prepare for the worst, we meet with a surgeon. We go in. They do an ultrasound on her ear, behind her ear. They say we find three lymph nodes. One you can see, two behind the one you can see that have enlarged. And we have to go in and we have to remove them because she has cancer. Why? Why? I don't understand why. This is a chapter that I did not write. This is a chapter that I would have never penned in my four-year-old's life. This is a chapter that I would have never put in my book. If I was writing my book, I would have never put that in there. But I changed the author a long time ago. And God saw fit that my four-year-old baby would come down with a disease that no preacher should ever deal with. chapter of life and my child is diseased and sick and in pain Monday we were supposed to go in for surgery the Sunday before brother John a preacher in my church was sitting at the back we called the church around to pray for my daughter because she was having surgery God spoke through prophetic word and said, if you'll praise me, I'll heal her. If you'll praise me, I'll heal her. Now, as the parent of a sick child, I didn't stand there and praise your name, God. I thank you, Lord, for healing my baby. I, you've got to understand that there was something within me that it took everything that I had just to preach in the pulpit. 
It took everything that I had to walk through the doors of the church because my chapter had changed. It took everything that I had to lift my hands and to stand in a pulpit and tell people that God is a healer when my baby was not healed. But it was the chapter that I was in. It was what I was facing at the time. My wife, hand in hand, did not care what was going on around us, did not care what the rest of the church was doing. We worshiped and we danced and we praised God because he told us that he would heal my baby if we would. And we worshiped and we danced and we praised God. And when we got home that night, I looked behind my daughter's ear and there was still swollen lymph nodes. And so I still had to take her Children's Hospital that morning, 4 a.m. They wheeled her back, and I stood there, and they said, Sir, you can come back to the surgery room until she goes out. I stood back. I took everything. While my daughter laid on an operating table, with everything not to cry. It took everything to stand there and pray over my child. Because you see, the chapter that I was in was a chapter of shaken faith. The chapter that I was in was a chapter, you see, it was just a few weeks earlier that a lady in my church came and said, Pastor, the doctor says I have cancer. Now this woman been coming to my church and did not say anything to me. And she walked up and she showed me and behind her ear was a cancer growing. It looked like a cocoon of a butterfly that attached itself behind her ear. And I laid my hands on her, Brother Harrington. My baby's still sitting out there unhealed and untouched. And I laid my hands on her and I declared healing over that woman. And as she went to work at Walmart the very next day and she was folding clothes, that cancer dropped off and landed in the pile of clothes. She went to the doctor she carried in a Ziploc bag and the doctor said, they tested it and said it was cancer. And he said, how did it fall off? And she said, my church prayed for me. And yet here I am in the operating room. And my child is having to have surgery. The doctor told me we're sending it to an oncologist for surgery. Whenever they got in, the one that was protruding out of her body was the only one they removed because the other two were completely gone. He said, we're sending the one that is protruding out to oncology to test for, to find out which kind of lymphoma it is. On Friday afternoon, the oncologist called and said, Mrs. Stutzman, we just wanted to call you and let you know that we find no cancer. And to call everybody that you know and tell them that your child is cancer free. My chapter began with cancer. But that, at the very end of that chapter, Though God pinned it in there, and though God put that in our lives, God still made a way of escape. 
My friend, it doesn't matter if your child isn't sitting on the pew today. The Bible says train up a child in the way that they should grow. And when they grow old, they will not depart from it. My friend, this chapter might be the chapter that they're outside of the church. But there's coming another chapter. The book isn't over yet. The author hasn't laid down the pen. He's still writing. He's still writing your future, my friend. <laughs> Hebrews 5 and 9 says, In being made perfect, he became the author of the eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. My friend, if your chapter right now is a little wishy-washy and you don't understand what's going on, hold on a little while longer. Hold on one more day because your chapter is going to change. Chapter is going to change, my friend. The best part of a good book is, is that it has another chapter. It has another time, another place, more characters. My friend, don't get discouraged when somebody walks out the door of the church and you look around and say man I miss sister so and so they're not here anymore my friend chapter 3 and chapter 4 has growth in your future my friend it might be chapter 5 and chapter 6 but God's bringing it Word of the Lord tells us in Philippians 6, 1 and 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform until the days of Jesus Christ. My friend, I have confidence that God is a healer. I have confidence that what God has started right here in this church, hallelujah, that God will complete. Hallelujah, that God will do a good work. That God will complete a good work. What God has done in your life, what God has changed, you have to understand that it is just three letters that separates the word author from the word authority. Three words. The thing about it is, is that many of us allow God to author, but we do not allow him to be our authority. There's a difference in allowing God to do things in our life and, and allowing God to change things and and the brother came and taught on, uh, on budget and things like that this morning. Amen. My friend, if you would allow God to be the authority of your life, you can set the pin of your own budget down. And let God begin to pin your budget. Amen. When you're faithful in the least. Amen. God will make you faithful in more. Amen. My friend, let me tell you something. If you don't know right now how it's going to happen. And you've done everything that you know to do. Let God be the authority. Let God be the authority. You've got to understand, and, and I've pastored long enough to know that there are people that walk up to the offering plate and they put offering in the plate for return. They do it because God said that if you'll give, will give, be given back, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. There are people that go and they put their tithing in every single week with no return. There are people that go and they still live in the same state that they've always lived. My friend, let God begin to author and authoritate the things of your life. And when he begins to be the authority, everything around you will change. 
I had a couple in my church. You may be seated. Their names was Jeremy and Stephanie. They came to my church. I'm, I'm sorry, they were coming to my church when I became the pastor of the church. This couple were the poorest people in my church. They drove the most ratty car, was falling apart, breaking down all the time. I did not know him that well. They went to church free days. When the churches were given away clothes for free, they'd be standing in line. They'd be the first in line. They would go to the food bank, and I, I'm, not, I'm not knocking any of this. Listen to me. But they would go to the food bank, and they would stand in line, and they would wait for you. And I began to sit and begin to talk to him after being there for a while. I told him, I said, Brother Jeremy, I've been your pastor for about six months now, and I've noticed that you've never paid your tithes. He said, Brother Stutzman, I've never even heard of that. I've never even heard of paying your tithes. Now, you've got to understand this, this man, I already told you, he's standing at the food bank. They're going to free days. He makes $18 an hour. He makes... He makes $18 an hour. There's not very many people that are making $18 an hour that are standing at the food bank. But the issue was is, is that he was making $18 an hour and all 18 of it was cursed. Amen. So I begin to teach to this man tithing. And he began to pay his tithe. And I begin to watch. His income did not change. But I begin to watch as his wife started walking in with coach purses. And she began to walk in with new things and new clothes. And they began to drive a different car. And they, they, he started buying suits to wear to church because uh, he wasn't going to the the, the cells at the churches anymore because all of a sudden there was a chapter change. All of a sudden there was a change. Now, now Jeremy and Stephanie, they attend the local charismatic church now. They left my church after being there for two years. They got upset and they left and I seen them out and he came to me and he hugged my neck and he said, Brother Stutzman, he said, I want to thank you. Of anything that I ever walked away with is that I pay my tithes and that God would bless me and that God would change my chapter. And though he goes to a different church and though he no longer sits under my ministry, he told me, he said, Pastor, I still pay my tithes. I still do what God has told me to do. And God is still blessing me because of a chapter. So many chapters that we see. There are so many things that go on in people's lives that I don't have the answer to. When you became an adult, they did not give you a handbook on how to adult. They don't have adulting for dummies. They probably do. They prob it's probably at Walmart. You you probably can find it. And if you buy it, you are a dummy. <laughs> Take that nine ninety five and put it in an offering. But they don't have books on how to be an adult. And they don't have books on how to go through things and, and how to do, do things in your life. Amen. They can have all the self-help books that they want. And, and my friend, don't quit reading because I'm telling you this. Amen. Don't quit reading. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Amen. Don't quit reading because you're double-minded. Amen. But the chapter changed. 
you realize the amount of people that set an apostolic church is today that does not have apostolic authority? Mm, yeah, y'all shut me down on that one. Do you realize the amount of apostolics that do not have apostolic authority? Amen. When you walk into the house of the Lord and there's no move of God there and there's no change there, there's no authority. Amen. When you lay hands on the sick and they don't recover, there's no authority. Amen. Whenever you lay hands on people's finances and they do not recover, there's no authority. People that walk into apostolic churches, there's apostolic churches that are having church right now that does not have apostolic authority. But we must, with everything within us, get to the chapter where the authority is released. Get to the chat. I'm not talking about your pastor. He had apostolic authority when he walked into this town and started a church. He, he, don't, he don't need your approval to have apostolic authority. If, if you thought he did, well, <laughs> you can give him 20 bucks. He, he don't need your approval. He got God's stamp of approval when God told him to come here. Amen. Amen. He, he don't need your approval. Amen. So he didn't need no apostolic authority when he came here. He brought it with him. Amen. What you have to do is you have to take what he is preaching from this pulpit and take it home. And begin to read chapter after chapter after chapter to your family. And use the authority that he is preaching with in your home. I tell my church all the time. I, I, there, I preached last Wednesday night. Borrowed conviction. Boy, y'all should have been at my church. I would have been a millionaire if they were handing me $20 bills. I borrowed convictions. And I talked about how we borrow convictions and how... The convictions that we have are not our own. Because pastor preaches it all of a sudden now I'm going to do it. Instead of allowing it to come into my life and change me. I'm just doing it. Amen. And there's so many that's in that chapter right now in the apostolic movement that have borrowed convictions. Amen. And I talked about how I can't go to your house and get you dressed. Amen. I I'm sorry, I don't have time, and I just don't want to see none of that. No. Especially this guy in the blue shirt back here. He, he, he can get his own self dressed, amen? He, he don't need a man of God telling him how to do it, amen? I might help you with your shoes, but that's as far as it goes. But apostolic authority, when you release it in your home, you don't have to ask your spouse, does this look too short? <laughs> I said I wasn't going to do it. Amen. You don't, you don't have to ask your spouse, do you think that this is right if we do this or if we do that? Amen. Apostolic authority preached from the pulpit begins to loose the husband of the home. Mm. It begins to allow the bishop to be the bishop. Amen. The bishop of the home walks in and begins to allow apostolic authority to release in the home. And the children line up. And the home lines up. There's so many that have gone beyond that chapter. And we expect our pastor to do it for us. And when our children do not line up. We take our word and we take the chapter that we don't want and we rip it out and we throw it in the trash and, and, and we take the bread of life, the Bible, the word of God, the food that we have and we lay it on the table and it collects dust and, and, and it collects mold and, and then whenever we want 
when our children are acting like devils, we take that same bread and that word and we throw it back in the preacher's face and we tell him, you're supposed to be the pastor. My friend, if our chapter is where it's supposed to be and our author is pinning the way that he is supposed to be pinning and we quit taking the authority from the man of God and from God himself and we allow God to be God and our shepherd to be our shepherd, then our book will line out with that book. From Genesis to Revelations, my life will line out when I allow God to begin to pin things that I didn't want. God begins to pin things that I do want. He begins to pin things that are good and pleasant and and that makes me feel good, but sometimes he pins things that chastises me. And, and the Bible says his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing. What does that mean? That it's cutting. It's, it's cutting me. It's hurting me. The things that I don't like. The things that I don't like in this word. It's, it's much easier to be entertained, my friend. It's much much, much, much easier to just live in the world, my friend. I, I'm just, that's just, that's just honesty. Hey Amen. It, it's easier not to get up at 8.30 on a Sunday morning and drive three hours and preach. It, just stay at home. Sleep in. Stay in bed. Hey Amen. But a long time ago, May 22nd, 1991, on a Wednesday night, I was nine years old. We were in revival, and God opened a new chapter in my life and filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was just a few la years later, at the age of 13 years old, sitting at the desk in my bedroom. I was homeschooled. Anybody else homeschooled out there? Yeah. Yeah, us homeschoolers need adulting for dummies. <laughs> my, my brother and I were the only people that we ever saw. Now I know why he went crazy. He was hanging out with me all the time. But at the age of 13 years old, I sat in my bedroom and God called me to preach and he began another chapter in my life. And though... There are things that I have stopped and begin to pin for myself. You see, the best part about God is he gives you self-will. You can serve him or not. The best thing about God is this, is that though he is the author and the finisher of my faith, that if I allow him to be my author, there are times in my life he allows me to pin chapters of my own because he trusts me. There is a special place with God that you can get that he can trust you. That he trusts you with pinning things. Pinning things in your own life. and Pinning things for your own wealth and your own good. But it is a true child of God that can hand the pen back and say, okay, you get the next one. You, you get the next chapter because I can't do it on my own. I, I, can't, I can't do this on my own. I, I, I don't know if anybody else can, but I can't do this on my own. I can't pin things as good as God can. You see, there are some blessings that I would think that God could give me that if I just allow him to begin to pin it, it's completely different. The blessings of the Lord are completely different when he begins to line them out and begins to change them. He that begun a good work 
can understand, preacher. You don't know what I'm going through right now. You don't know the turmoil that I'm in in my mind and in my spirit. You don't realize the hours that I stay up at night and I pray for my family. You don't realize what I'm going through. No, I probably don't realize what you're going through, but I realize that if you would change your autobiography, if you would change the author and let God begin to write and God to begin to change. My friend, it's not going to be easy at the beginning. There's still going to be some bumps in the road and there's going to be some things that come along the way. But God is writing a pretty good book in my life. He's writing a pretty good book in my life. And if at the end of my book... The chapter says the end, I'm in trouble. Because I don't want my story just to end. But the end of the book, the chapters of my life, the end of my book, Brother Harrington needs to say enter in. Thou good and faithful servant. To the joys of the Lord. Stand with me. It was in 2006, Laura Story wrote the song, Blessings. The faith song, story song about the faith story sang about was put through the unexpected fires of fear and loneliness. Most young newlyweds don't imagine being kept alive at one point by breathing machines or having to find their way through significant post-operative visions and memory loss. Could grace notes resound from such a life-altering struggle? Laura's song, Blessings, goes we pray for blessings we pray for peace comfort for family protection while we sleep we pray for healing for prosperity we pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering all the while you he you hear each spoken need yet love us way too much to give us lesser things because what if blessings come through raindrops? What if healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if the trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while, you hear each desperate plea and long that we'd have faith to believe. Because what if blessings come through raindrops? What if healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? What if the trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? When friends betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know what pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home because what if, what if your blessings come through raindrops? And if your healing comes through tears, what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know your need? What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is a revealing of a great thirst this world cannot satisfy? What if and what if trials of this life, the rain, the storm, the hardest nights are your mercies in disguise? For a story pinned the words of that song 
right before her husband's funeral. She and her husband had only been married for just a little while when sickness came and death found its way. My friend, there are times that the chapters in your book are going to be of death and of pain, of sickness, God forbid, of divorce, broken children, broken homes, broken families, drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes, all in your book. The book that you never saw these chapters being penned in. But what of it? What if those chapters are what brought you to an old-fashioned altar? What if the chapter that you just finished was the chapter that had the worst pain of your life in it and the next chapter will have the most joy you'll ever experience what if you came to church all of your life and the chapter that you were in brought offense and you didn't wait for the next chapter but you decided that people was more important than God. That what people had to say and what people had against you was more important than His church. What if you decided on that one chapter of being hurt? To turn and walk out and never come back. And the very next chapter brought the most horrifying car accident in your life that left you mangled and hurt. And now you have no I'm not trying to scare somebody today and I'm not being hypothetical but I'm telling you what happens every day that people become hurt and broken whether it be in the church or whether it be in a marriage or whether it be at a job it does not matter there are things that happen every single day. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. And in my mind, there are things that I cannot explain. I wish I could. I wish I could tell you why you're going through what you're going through. But 1 Peter 1 and 7 says that the trials of your faith being much more precious than of, fire, of gold that perishes. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, there are some trials in my life and chapters that I'm going through that my praise determines whether I make it out. My attitude, my appearance, the way that I treat people determines if chapter 4 is going to be different than chapter 3. And all the while, it is God himself That though you come to the end of your life and you never allowed him to pin one chapter in your life, he will always pin the very last chapter. 
Though you lived a life of sin and disgrace, it does not matter. It doesn't matter if you're atheist, if you're homosexual, or if you're 100% apostolic. We all have a final chapter. And at the end of that chapter, as I already said, it will either say, enter in, thou good and faithful servant, into the joys of the Lord. Or it will say, depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, for I know you not. My friend, it does not matter if this is your first time in church or if this is your 60th year in church if it's your hundredth or thousand year in church it does not matter what matters is is that today you still have breath in your body and your chapter your final chapter is not finished and you have the ability to walk or to kneel today and to allow the autobiography that you've been writing to become the biography that God wants it to be. Father, I ask you today that every person under the sound of my voice, Lord, God, that they would begin to feel your hand of mercy in this house today. God, and that they would realize, Lord, that you're not done yet. Though they might be facing pain today, that tomorrow, that it will be gone. (laughs) That weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. That called chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 might not have been that good. But I know that if I allow you to begin to pin some things, and I allow you to become the author and the finisher of my faith, that God, you would begin to change things in my life come on across this house come on let God begin to change the chapter come on let God begin to write some new things (laughs) come on if you've got some still worship in you let him write another chapter with new worship (laughs) if you've got a still prayer life let him write a new chapter where you used to not be a prayer but now you're a prayer warrior oh let him change your chapter It might look like it's over. It might look like the devil has the final say. Hallelujah. But my God, my God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the ever-present help in the time of need. Hallelujah. The chapter you're in right now isn't the chapter you're going to die in. But God, by the authority of the Holy Ghost, I declare, God is going to step in gotta change it. Come on, lift up your hands across this house. Begin to let God change some things. Come on, begin to let God change some things in Clara, Oklahoma. He la 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 Come on, when others have said that revival cannot be here. Hallelujah, I remember as I took the church in Lawton, Oklahoma, and people said, it's a burnt over field. Don't go there. There's a 
140,000 souls in Lawton, Oklahoma. My friend, it ain't burnt over. Just because others think it is don't mean that the chapter of this town is done. house. I, I lose healing in this house. I lose apostolic authority in this house. Hallelujah. Come on, it's not over. Don't listen to the enemy of your soul. trying to do a work in your life right now. Come on. Don't hold back. Let him loose in your ears. In the name of Jesus. in your life. 